Senator Hirono is on remote. Can you hear me, Senator? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Dr. Ray, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Ray, following the January 6th insurrection, you and other senior law enforcement officials uh, were missing from public view, and uh, the people who were providing the briefings to the public uh, were the, the D.C. acting U.S. attorney and the assistant director of the FBI's Washington field office. I hope you agree that at a time like this, it would be very important for high-level law enforcement people like you and others to have briefed the public to limit the spread of misinformation about what happened and who uh, was behind what happened. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, certainly, I agree it's important to prevent misinformation uh, as much as we can, uh, consistent with our legal responsibilities. And part of the misinformation that happened was that, um, and you've testified, that so far there is no evidence of fake Trump supporters committing or provoking violence during the January 6th riot at the Capitol. That's part of the misinformation that got out. Were you aware of these false claims? Uh, well, certainly along the way, we've seen a, a whole variety of claims from a variety of people uh, about the investigation into the January 6th attack, uh, just like with a lot of other high-profile attacks. Um, whether I can recall exactly when the first time I've heard that specific claim, uh, I don't know for sure. This is, this is part of the kind of um, false information and narrative that, that got out, blaming others such as Antifa for what happened. So that, that is uh, why I think it is really important for you and others like you to be up, out front. You've been asked some questions about hate crimes, and you acknowledge that there is a rise in hate crimes against the AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islander community. Uh, wouldn't you agree that uh, calling the COVID-19 the Kung flu or the China virus adds to the kind of, of targeted hate crimes that we are seeing arise uh, against the AAPI community? Well, I, I don't know that it's really my place as FBI director to start uh, weighing in on rhetoric, but I can assure you that that's not language I would ever use. And hate crimes against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders is something that we are concerned about. We take very seriously. Uh, we are investigating where we have facts sufficient to do that. We're also engaged in a variety of uh, forms of outreach uh, to the public. Uh, I think we've done, you know, 60 plus training or liaison events with the Asian American Pacific Islander community uh, since just March of last year. We've put out uh, intelligence reports to our partners about hate crimes uh, against that community in particular. Uh, and it's something we take very seriously. I, co I commend you for working with, I assume, local and state, uh, uh, state and local law enforcement entities as well as community advocacy groups uh, to uh, to deal with the rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans. And in fact, just a few weeks ago, uh, there were lethal attacks on, uh, there seems to be a, a targeting of a senior Asians. And so lethal attacks in San Francisco and in New York. And I think these are totally unprovoked attacks. And so uh, I, I think that we need to continue to focus on what the community can do and what law enforcement can do to make sure that these crimes are prosecuted as the hate crimes that they are. And I think it is also important for, for leaders to uh, not uh, fan the flames by calling COVID-19 the China virus or Kung flu. You also testified, and you were asked some questions about the role of social media um, by these extremist groups. And you said that terrorism moves at the speed of social media. Senators Warner, Klobuchar, and I recently introduced the Safe Tech Act, which would pull back Section 230 immunity from tech companies for things like civil rights violations and wrongful death suits. Do you think that exposing these companies to civil liability would uh, force them basically to uh, take extremist content off of their platforms? 
people to take these kinds of content more seriously and do something about them? Well, Senator, uh, I, I want to be careful not to uh, get out uh, ahead of the rest of the administration and weighing in on specific pieces of legislation. But having said that, uh, I think there are a few things I could say. You know, one is while the immunity uh, under Section 230 has obviously helped the evolution of the social media industry, it's also allowed it to avoid uh, a, a lot of the uh, burdens and risks that other mm -hmm. brick and mortar companies uh, have had to face. And it means that important decisions uh, that affect many aspects of society uh, that would normally be made by the people's elected representatives are now being made in corporate offices uh, in the industry. And so while I can't comment on specific legislation, I certainly can tell you that I see the value, maybe is the best way of putting it, uh, of incentivizing online platforms to address both illicit content uh, on their platforms uh, and to assist law enforcement in bringing to justice criminals who use those platforms to mm -hmm. victimize Americans. And then there is also the concern that as uh, entities such as Facebook and Twitter do more to control, uh, modify these, these, this kind of uh, content, then uh, this could encourage, um, drive the extremists to use encrypted platforms like Telegram and Signal. So that's another area that we're going to need to address. I wanted to turn briefly to your testimony that, that uh, identifies lone wolf actors as a concern for you, and I think that with regard to lone wolf actors, we need a, probably a, a, a whole of society approach. So what can we all do to deal with the problem of lone wolf extremists? So I appreciate the question. Uh, we do consider that the, the, the lone actor, uh, I've, I've sort of stopped using the term wolf because I feel like it gives them too much credit. Um, mm. But the lone actors, whether they're homegrown violent extremists or domestic violent extremists, uh, is a is a real threat because one of the a because it's so uh, pervasive, but b because unlike somebody who's working as part of a large group, somebody acting alone has fewer people they're in contact with, which means fewer mm -hmm. dots to connect, uh, etc. It makes it that much harder for us to get in front of. What we desperately need is more and more situations where uh, the members of the public who know that person who see the transformation, who see things starting to change in a way that they know is different and has, has become much darker and more dangerous, those people to speak up, to co contact law enforcement, whoever they trust in law enforcement, uh, to, to alert people to the threat. And the good news, if there's any good news in this, is that we are seeing that happen more and more uh, in this country. Uh, I, you know, we've had lots of people, uh, as heartbreaking as it must be, uh, turn in family members when they see this transformation because they know that having us or our partners intercede uh, may not only prevent that person from committing an attack against an innocent American, but also may in some instances result in that person being off-ramped to get help uh, as opposed to potentially being killed by law enforcement or incarcerated or something else. So. Uh, we need the people, we always say if you see something, say something, and most people picture the abandoned backpack in a Greyhound bus terminal. Obviously we want people to see something and say something there. But we also need people, if they see something about somebody, to say something. Uh, and the more of that we can have and the more members of Congress as, as key voices in their communities, in, their, in your uh, home states, can encourage people to do that. That's one of the key weapons we have as a country, uh, to, your, to use your phrase, a whole of society uh, defense against this threat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.